Hey Eric, it's really good to see you again. Um, it's really nice to be able to reach out and, and talk to producers in the field, which we really enjoy as part of our research at the University of Guelph. So I'm Dr. Kathy Bauman. I'm a veterinarian that's been in practice for over 30 years now. I graduated about 30 years ago, um, but I've been at the university for going on, I guess, seven years now, five years as a faculty member. So I'm an epidemiologist by training, so we like to look for patterns of diseases, um, but I'm a researcher who really enjoys um, doing research with small ruminants, so sheep and goats but my particular interest is on the dairy side, so dairy sheep and dairy goats. Um, so I enjoy doing research um, to help producers um, be more uh, efficient and sustainable and to um, improve the welfare overall of, of the animals. Production limiting diseases is kind of a, a special interest for me, so diseases such as Yoni's disease, CAE, which is caprine arthritis encephalitis, and Mady Visna, because really on a day-to-day -day basis, they, they really impact the welfare and lifespan of, of the goats, and in turn, um, the productivity and kind of the mental well-being of the producers that raise them. Our video today is more specified on, uh, you guys have asked the question of why we take the kids away from the mothers. So the reason why we do that is in the simple term is because of this disease that Kathy briefly described was CAE. Now, CAE, that's just the short form name. What is the politically correct name? I know it's <laughs> a longer name and I don't remember it because it's easy to remember yeah. CAE. No worries. So Eric's right. This is uh, the short form and it's CAE and sometimes you'll hear it called as CAEV. And so it means caprine or caprine, which refers to goats, um, or arthritis, encephalitis, virus. So arthritis means inflammation of the joints, encephalitis means inflammation of the lining of the brain, and then you'll often have the, the virus tacked on the end, just to denote that um, it, it's different from a bacterial uh, pathogen that may be causing other diseases. So we have a disease that's very similar to this in sheep that you may have heard of called Mady Visna or MV. Um, and it's a slightly different disease, but to be honest, Eric, the, the virus that causes CA in goats can jump to sheep, and the virus that causes maybe business sheep can actually jump to goats. So we actually have to be careful when we're housing both goats and sheep together that they're both free of disease or be implementing biosecurity measures to make yeah, sure they yeah, don't yeah. jump. Yeah, for sure. Uh, now, where originally does this virus come from? Yeah, it's really hard to say definitively. In Iceland, they were one of the first ones to detect Mady Visna. We do know that it probably originated in Europe because all the breeds of goats that we currently are, are milking here in North America and a lot of other countries originated in France and Switzerland, the Netherlands and what have you, Italy, and that they pro the virus probably originated there. And with us importing the goats to, yeah. to North America, the virus came with it. It was first identified in the 70s and 80s where we were able to associate it with the lameness and the mastitis that, that often occurs with it and with the wasting that we often um, see in sheep along with a little bit of pneumonia. Okay, now you had said that um, from Iceland or Europe, mm -hmm. is there a potential that through the semen that they would, may have imported through our artificial breeding yeah. that we could have brought it in that way too? Yeah, so Eric, you bring up a really good point. There's multiple modes of transmission and we don't always, um, we can't always definitively pin it on one source. So it can come in with animals, animals that we bring into our country or animals that we bring into our farm. It can, the virus can be shed in semen, not always, but it can be. Um, so um, bringing in a bunch of semen can infect animals as well. It's shed in respiratory particles. So animals with the virus that breathe on or cough on other animals transmit it that way. It is also um, passed in the feces. And the one that we most worry about is that, that it passes in milk and colostrum. Yeah. So to, yeah, to be able to keep it from say your animals in the barn mm -hmm. uh, to keep the young ones from getting it. That's how we can kind of stop it through the milk. Yeah. Right, right, okay. But the interesting thing about viruses, I think that a lot of people don't realize is they actually require the cells of our body, whether we're humans or animals to replicate. So in and of themselves, they're really not able to, to um, reproduce on their own. So they, in a sense, hijack our own cells to, to reproduce themselves. 
So in goats, this CAE virus likes to take over some of the white blood cell line in goats. So that's monocytes and macrophages. And so anywhere we have inflammation that the white blood cells are kind of drawn to to fight off infection, it takes this virus with it. So if you think about, you know, maybe you have mastitis, then those white blood cells go to the udder. And what's really interesting is when we make colostrum, a lot of those white blood cells get shed in the colostrum. And that's why it's a very big source of infection um, right after kidding. Yeah, so then you'll see that uh, we'll show later of a, a doling that I have where the CAE has attacked the white blood cells because they're all in that udder creating that milk. And what it has done is it has made the udder like a rock. It's just, she looks full. She doesn't really have a lot of room in her to produce that much milk because she's so inflamed and it's just, it's just taken over everything. When these white blood cells go to an area, they fibrose the tissue, so they make it very stiff. And like Eric says, then there becomes no room to make milk in those little alveoli that are making up the udder of the gland. It's just hard tissue. And then that would be the same thing with the knees too, right? With the they knees. would just inflame everything and they just walk on the knees because they can't bend the knees straight. Yeah. So anytime they bump themselves, so on a joint or they're, you know, kneeling down frequently, that becomes a small area of inflammation. And again, those white blood cells zooming there thinking they're doing the right thing. And it would be the right thing in a healthy animal. But the bad thing is those white blood cells got hijacked by these little viruses. So then the viruses are heading to the joints, causing them to swell and become very stiff and painful. Yeah. Now, uh, the effects on, on the animals mm -hmm. in the different stages. So CAE, how would that affect a kid? How would that affect a younger doling and an older nanny type? Because yeah. obviously it's gonna affect each one differently because yep. the young kid and the dueling don't milk, whereas the older nanny would, right? Yeah, it really depends, Eric. And I think this is what's so frustrating with the disease is there's no just one single presentation. That it, can, it really depends on when they were exposed to the virus, whether they were exposed as a kid or kind of later on as an adult, because even adults are susceptible to infection. Yeah. Um, and the disease is funny. You can be exposed to the virus and contract an infection and not see symptoms for months or even years at a time. So again, that kind of affects the presentation as well. Um, we talked about it maybe causing encephalitis. Um, if that occurs, it often occurs in the really young kids. Uh, we just don't see it um, as often in Ontario and here in Canada as maybe they do in other countries. Um, but that would be kind of um, an, an example of where the kid was likely exposed right after birth and by seven or nine months of age, they may be experiencing the encephalitis. So head pressing, very dull. But, you know, there's a lot of causes of, of meningitis and encephalitis um, in goat kids anyway. Okay. So that's sometimes hard to differentiate from listeria or uh, polio encephalomyelitis. So that yeah. can sometimes be hard to identify if we're not watching. So it's something it. that if you wanted to know if the kid had passed, already you'd have to send it out for testing in order to know which one it really was because in goats uh, a lot of diseases look like a lot of other diseases it's really important when we're unsure uh, about what exactly is going on to send the, the kids for post-mortem either through your veterinarian or through a, a laboratory organization that will, will do that for you now are there more um is it more can it more affect like a different breed of goat versus another. Yeah. Like I'm sure a lot of these uh, um, small people that have just a few goats in the backyard along with other animals may not know really what we're talking about because it's just not present. But is that a breed thing? Is that just because they're out in the open type thing and not more susceptible to these types of things? Um, yeah, it's. It, we often see it more in the dairy breeds, um, just simply because um, of the breed lines that they come from. 80% um, of herds in Ontario have CAE, so it doesn't leave a lot of herds without it from which we can buy from. Yeah. Testing is unreliable, so even though we think we may have bought CAE-free animals, if we haven't tested at the right time or used the right test, we're sometimes thinking about negative animals and we get positive ones. 
Um, the other aspect is stress plays a big role. So it's not always breed, but a lot of the dairy breeds are under a bit more stress than maybe meat goat breeds because they're giving birth and then milking and that just puts some stress on the body that maybe the meat goats are, meat goat breeds are not um, undergoing as well. There's been a, a trend to try and identify genetic resistance to CAE. It's just in the early steps of, of identifying which genes make them more susceptible or more resistant. So I've only seen the results of one or two projects in that sense. So I think it's too early to be, be breeding for resistance to CAE. Oh, okay. That testing and culling and doing some preventative practices like feeding an alternate colostrum and milk products is probably a better way to go for now. But you know, that may be something we're dealing with in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still very uh, at the beginning, early mm -hmm. stages, right? Yeah. It's still quite a big thing around here. Uh, can their diets and, and the and the goats diet so for myself right we're feeding fermented feed say somebody is feeding more of a dry hay that's more natural or they're out on pasture in the summer can that have any effect so it's not it probably would be so much the feed eric that we do know that animals kept in intensive rearing um, environments such you know, they're sharing a lot of the same air are probably more likely to transmit it. So being yeah. out on pasture is, is maybe gonna um, introduce more fresh air and decrease the likelihood of, of transmission. So it's more that. Um, feed, no, is, is unlikely except in, in the kids. And that's why we really focus on um, changing the diets of kids during the pre-weaned period, um, not so much in the adults. But it is important that they have a really balanced diet. So again, that they're not being yeah. stressed and too thin because the more stress to the immune system, they're less likely to keep this infection in check. Um, in, in about 20% of the animals that have this infection, will you see clinical signs? So that other 80% are kind of silent carriers. Yeah. And so I think within that 20% that actually go on to show clinical signs, maybe they were stressed or had more infections or inflammation that predisposed them to then kind yeah. of developing those other signs. Um, I was just gonna go over some of the other, you mentioned you know, encephalitis, you know, wanting to know all the clinical signs. Yeah. So I was just gonna kind of rope back to that um, and talk about um, how the, the joint diseases don't show up in the young animals that we often see it in, in the adult animals that Eric had, had mentioned. So not until they're two to three years of age do we often see the joint swelling. Do you see it in, how old would, would any be that you have noticed? Uh, generally, it's not in the kids. I have a really weird one, but I know it's not CAE because it's different. She likes to do handstands all the time. Okay. Uh, so because CAE is more prevalent, we know it, we know it more prevalent to be in the front knee. So you'll see they'll always the walk like their their front hooves are sore. So they won't want to walk. They'll walk kind of funny like this. It's very rare that it's in the back. Mm -hmm. If they do have joint issues, it's often in what we call the front carpal joint. So like their front knees, like you're saying, um, we rarely see it in the, in the other joints. And it has something more to do with the stress of how goats are constantly getting up and down. If you notice it compared to horses or cows, they're a little bit different. And, and goats are sometimes lazy. They tend to be kind of air on the side of what we call being knee walkers anyway. Yeah. Um, and so again, that puts a little bit more stress where instead of just getting up, they might just kind of crawl over sometimes um, and you'll see their both front legs are down and their back legs are up, kind of propelling them along. But yeah. when we notice a, a higher prevalence of knee walkers, we definitely get concerned beyond being one or two. So that's usually in adults over two to three years of age. And you'll see marked swelling in one or both of those front leg joints. Yeah, yeah. Um, the mastitis is not as common. We definitely see the joint swelling more often in goats as a, as a symptom of, of um, or a clinical sign of CAE in goats. But you'll often see that really, we call it endurative mastitis. Um, that's just, again, really hard swelling of those tissues so that they can't make milk anymore. Um, yeah. So it's not that we'll notice signs of mastitis, but yeah, just that big swollen, they call it hard bag sometimes, that yeah. it's, it's just really firm. Yeah, and the mastitis is not very common in the goats because of our bedding techniques. Now, they test for CAE. Can you explain a little bit how the testing works uh, for us? Yeah, sure. 
So we're all familiar, you know, after these last couple of years with testing for viral infections and we've, we're all sick of doing swabs of our throats and noses for viral particles. Well, in those particular tests, they were looking for DNA of the viruses. With our particular disease, we're not looking for the DNA, we're looking for antibodies. And what these tell us, especially in the bloodstream, we can also check the milk, um, but we're looking for circulating antibodies that tell us that animal's been exposed to that virus. Um, they develop the antibodies roughly 30 to 60 days after exposure. Uh, I'm, I'm it's gonna be dose dependent on how much virus they got exposed to at what stage of their life as to whether that infection clears or becomes what we call persistent. Um, so you could test an animal sometimes positive and then test, you know, four to six weeks later and it might be negative. If you're at all concerned, retest in four to six weeks and just compare those two results. Okay. Um, so we developed that infection 30 to, or developed those antibodies 30 to 60 days after that first exposure. Um, but where we really see those antibodies um, become an issue is any time after two years of age is where they really seem to go up and be indicative of, of having the viral persisting infection. We, we know also that the higher the titer, usually it goes up with the uh, more clinical signs they're experiencing. So for example, that goat with the swollen knees is likely going to have a much higher titer than that goat that's showing no clinical signs at all. So it tends to kind of correlate one with the other um, with how much their antibody level is. But like I say, you could maybe just have one or two goats with clinical signs and that can lull you into thinking you don't have that much CAE when in fact you might have 60 to 70% of your herd affected because like I said, only about 20, 25% of them will show clinical signs. Yeah. So that's what's so scary about CAE is by the time you have one clinical case, you probably have a lot more infected animals, which is can be heartbreaking if you, you thought you had a negative herd. I was just wondering, so you said there that, you know, you could have 60-70% of your herd infected and not even know how serious is it? How detrimental to the herd and to the milk and to the, the owner of the farm if their herd does have such a high percentage they of infected. Yeah. yeah, so the overall repercussions are that you'll often have reduced milk production overall. So the, um, producers have found when they've gone CAE negative or they've what we call depopulated, so they got rid of their current herd and then and went and pur purchased a herd that does not have the disease, they noticed their milk production definitely was increased and they had fewer, on the goat side, there's reports of fewer cases of pneumonia. It's anecdotally reported, but overall the welfare of the animals just seems to be higher, less lameness on, on with the, the knee walkers and um, overall um, better health in, in, in the kids. So those of you that may only have a few animals in your backyard and are curious more about this, um, there's a few things that uh, Dr. Caffey had talked about that may lead you to think that maybe you have it. Don't be discouraged because of it. Um, it it's, like, it's like me, in a sense, having the beginning stages of cancer. I don't know it, or I may not know it, until several years down the road when I when there's, there's a sign of hey maybe I have it it's the same thing with the goats you may you may not have it don't think it's the end of the world because of it now I love my animals as much as you do of course so I'm doing the best I can to prevent them from having that right by by taking the kids off the mother now um, she talked also about nose to nose contact and through the fetus, so uh, through the fecal, sorry. So um, I may have to change the way I group my animals to, to be able to kick that a little bit more so that I don't have that because currently right now, right, I have the two middle groups are able to touch nose to nose or I'm putting goats that are four years old in with the newer goats. So the newer goats may not have it, um, but are now being introduced to it. So I may not see signs of it for a couple of years, but that all depends on your stress levels. So reduce stress levels in your animals and that will help it stay at bay at well. 
as well, right? Don't move them around. Don't change their diet. Don't like, there's so many different things that you can do. Oh, right? there's so it's, many variables, Eric, you know, housing, overstocking, right? Yeah. And, and many of us are dealing with facilities that just don't enable us to completely separate our animals. And it's, it's objective, you know, at the end of the day, we have to make money, yeah. right? We need a check coming in. We can't just willy nilly get rid of our herd and buy a whole other herd. Um, but, and it depends, you know, do you have a small herd or what have you. Eric's right. It doesn't mean that you have to get rid of your animals if they're positive. It, knowledge is power, right? So the last thing we want to do is bury our head in the sand and not test at all. If they're positive, it, it doesn't mean we have to get rid of them. You know, we're all very attached to our animals. They all have names and, and reasons why we're keeping them for, for different reasons that are not always logical. Um, and if I had a CAE positive of the 20 that I have currently milking, I would, um, I think I would keep them because I'm very attached to the ones that we have within our family. But what I would do is then test everybody and then probably separate out the ones that are positive from the ones that are negative. There are various strategies for all producers. So we don't want to say that every producer needs to be CAE negative. Um, like I said, at the end of the day, it's more important to be profitable for the time being, just for our own well-being. Those of you who don't, may not already know this, but we are from Ontario, Canada. So where we do our testing may be completely different to how you guys may need to do your testing or how they do it. Be sure to check with your local veterinarian yeah. and they know where to send the tests off and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, the conversation is always best started with having a veterinarian come out because testing, it's just not simple. The veterinarian wants to know your objective by testing. So you yeah. should always have a goal in mind. But again, prevention is feeding those kids um, either uh, heat treated and pasteurized goat colostrum and, and milk. So we can still feed goat milk and goat colostrum, but we just need to heat treat it in some way that it destroys the virus. It's yeah. very sensitive to heat. Um, but other methods are feeding artificial colostrum replacement product. And in Canada, the goat replacement products, whether milk or colostrum, are made from cow's milk. Um, there's no um, goat milk replacement products or colostrum replacement products available currently. And then other producers will get um, cow's colostrum and cow's milk from neighboring farms. But again, we just emphasize that that should be heat treated on the colostrum side. So we're not heating it too high that we're destroying the antibodies and also pasteurizing them any milk that we're then feeding as well. Yeah, and for those of you, uh, heat treating, uh, we currently do that with cow colostrum and that is bringing it up to 145 degrees Fahrenheit for a half an hour. Uh, you don't want to get it too much higher because uh, as she said, you, you get it too high, you burn the good antibodies in the milk. Um, also, you do not want to do it in a microwave. You got to do it over your oven or a stove or some kind of fire and keep it at that consistent 145 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour. Uh, that's how we do it awesome. and it works. It, it works pretty good. Well, we thank you very much for coming out today and helping us, uh, helping everybody. I hope you all learned something today too uh, about this. Um, this is, uh, hopefully you guys learned. It was very, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of here? Informative. Yeah, uh, we, we briefed, this is all based off of the question why we don't let the kids drink from the mom. It may have seemed very far-fetched, but it's all linked back as she was saying. So you asked a nutshell of a question and we <laughs> gave you the whole spectrum. Yeah, <laughs> it's very unusual. So unless you're familiar with the dairy goat and also yeah. the dairy sheep and you know, we're pulling them off also to maximize milk yield. You know, if we left the, the kids on, sometimes they feed more on one side of that or then yeah. than normally but we're also doing it for the health reasons and the well-being of the kids we're not doing it to be mean to them in any sense it's the exact opposite we're doing yeah. them because we care about them all right okay thank you very much no for your time worries, Eric. For i appreciate out. coming out and talking with you i just feel like the more we can share information and the understanding behind why we do things yeah the more likely you know we'll get people participating in cae eradication and testing and what have you yeah. so thanks for having me today oh uh, no worries so right. we can see compared to other goats that her udder is quite a bit more distended than some goats excuse me
Excuse me. Um, but one of the things that kind of gives it away is how firm it is. And so, you know, most goats you'll be able to indent somewhat when they um, have a swollen under, especially if just after they kid it. But you can see with this one, it's just really hard as hard as a rock. And again, it's just cross fibers within the udder that have become very um, firm and inflexible. And it's just <laughs> the know, very lovely. They all want to be part of the film. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's a really good example of uh, a CAE udder. Now, incidentally, this one doesn't have the swollen joints on the front. So we're not always going to see that. Um, and it is normal, I'll just get you to spin it around, Eric. Sometimes we'll see these calluses just on goat's knees without them being anything, okay? So just because you have calluses on your goat's knees does not mean you have CAE. It would be the <laughs> swelling around the actual joint itself that would give that away. And so we can see this one. It's definitely not as suspended and that we can push it in and, and feel that that's milk within there as well. Okay, that's a normal you. one. That's what they should look like. So we can see here how, yeah, we do have calluses, but we also have this big swollen joint. You can see it both from the side and both from the front. See how it's distended here? It can actually feel that swelling within the joint. And so it's inflammation of the lining of that joint. So it's swelling out like a bursitis. Cinevitis is what we would call it. And again, you can see in the back, they're not swollen, but just on her, it's just the one in the front. Maybe the other one is too. And so yeah, that they're going to have a, 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 an odd walk because it's stiff and they're not able to completely bend that joint. Yeah, they don't want to bend that properly. We thank you guys for watching the video. Uh, if you have not already, please subscribe to support the channel. This is not going to be the last of Dr. Kathy that we are going to see because she is very full of a lot of knowledge in different areas about goats um to help with the youtube algorithm to let other people know about this important information that we shared today give her a good like thanks for watching and god bless